to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 uh, it's, it's quite perfect. California, not today. Not today. <laughs> Talk about timing. <laughs> as soon as right, you hit right, you know, it it's it's just the the non-stop unexpected interruptions, um, the spam of the world. Mash, you know, a man that 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 stuff came in a can way back when. Spam? Spam you? Yeah, spam? It, still yeah. Comes, it still comes in a can. Yeah, so how appropriate to name those uh, calls on a meat that comes in a can. I wonder why they named them both spam. Hmm. That, I think that's a whole nother show. We can talk about that now. So. <laughs> oh gosh. You know, I came cruising across the Anthony Hende at minus 35, I think it is today. Mm -hmm. And everything moves differently when it is cold. Yep. Yeah. And Kimberly, you are in Cancun. Yes, I am for, yeah. for the week. Well, I go back on Monday, but I am on vacation mm. escaping that. That's for sure. Beautiful. Enjoy. Yeah. Enjoy. Right. Looking I mean, maybe it'll be too. better when you come back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who knows, right? <laughs> so how has your life led you to be able to be back on the sun? Yeah, like how's your life led you to the place that it is traveling? Sorry, you cut off. I don't such know if a it's my place. internet, but I heard how my life has led me to, and then you cut out. Traveling. Oh, traveling. Okay. Ooh, traveling. You know, um, my first career was as a teacher. And I had never traveled outside of Canada. And then one year I had been teaching and a group of us teachers decided to go to the Dominican Republic. And at the time I taught mm -hmm. English and French in Edmonton. And I was, okay, let's go. And before the plane had landed, like I had this mm. innate sense of I need to learn Spanish. And I don't, I don't know, I didn't know why or what, but it was just like, I need this. And I had had the most magical week in the Dominican, fell in love with Latin culture, the Spanish language. And I was like, yeah, there's something here. There was something. I could just feel there was a longing. And fast forward a year, and I was contracted to work at the American School in Puerto Vallarta. And I had never been to Mexico before. I had never, never even thought in my wildest dreams that I would pack up my life and move. And I did. And I remember getting off the plane and this is back, you know, this was 2005 and we didn't have the jetways in, in Vallarta. So we landed on the tarmac and they opened up the, the doors and, you know, this is August 10th of 2005. So August in Vallarta. Yeah, exactly. Daphne, it is hot and it is humid and it's like nothing this Alberta girl has ever seen. And mm -hmm you know, immediately I start to sweat, but it felt like 10,000 pounds had been lifted from my shoulders. And I just heard the voice and it said, you're home. And I felt it. So yeah, ever since then, there's been just the soul connection I have with Mexico. It, it has always felt like home from the minute I got off that plane that first day. Hmm. I love how you say the voice. Yes. Because we often we often don't know exactly what that voice is. It could be an angel. It could be an archangel. It could be an ascended master. It could be anything connected to our inner knowing. Yeah. Could have been my soul. It's like that. I have since yeah. uncovered yeah. that. I've had multiple lifetimes here in this country, right? So it's like just 
I didn't know at the time what it was, but I knew enough that to just trust it and and follow it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, trusting and following is such a such an exciting adventure, and it involves mm-hmm. a lot of surrender. Mm-hmm. Yes. Absolutely. A tremendous amount of surrender. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I walked into a country that I had never been, didn't speak the language, didn't know anybody, didn't know what my job was going to be like. And it was just, just going to trust and surrender. Had you listened to all of the worries, right? Had you listened to all the worries? Because, I mean, there's a lot of, um, hmm, there's a lot of that when it comes to traveling to third world countries. What were you going to say, Daph? I was going to say that sounds like such an exciting adventure. I have I have some beautiful friends that uh, their home is a school bus. They've made an entire home out of a school bus. And they used to live here in Canada. And they drove down to Guatemala last year. And they were back up here for a visit just this past summer. But they are down there now. And they're staying there because she's expecting and they're going to have a baby. Right? But they... They, they've got a place called Fire, Firefly Gardens in Guatemala. So I have no idea where that is related to you, Kimberly. But, <laughs> I mean, it could be like this close or it could be like this close. I don't know. But, I mean, it's closer than I am. So I'm just saying, if you <laughs> happen to see a Firefly Garden something or other, I got some friends that live there. And, I mean, that was there, you know. This is what we have to do. And they love it. Wouldn't change it for yeah. the world. Mm-hmm. You got to put some skin in the game. You have Absolutely. to put some skin in the game. And I mean, whether that is physical skin or finances, you have to risk it for the biscuit. Um, mm-hmm. And that's where the, the, we're you know, out of the comfort zone into the free fall. Yes. Bold. Bold. Yes. So how important was faith or spirit in your adventure? You know, I would say without knowing it, it played a really significant role. Um, And even just how it wove the rest, because that was in 2000, that was 2005. But then Mm -hmm. um, in 2011, for example, on the same night, it was one night, it was Mexican Independence Day, I'll never forget it. I met two of the most important people that I would meet that year. And it was like one of them was was going to bring me some darkness and really push me. And the other was one of my soul, one of my soul friends, soul family. And I met to meet them the same night. I'm like, I know now there's no such thing as coincidence. I needed her to help me get through him. And like, there was just Mm. so much synchronicity that happened because of what she was also going through. And then even two years later, three years later, it was faith in that voice that brought me back to Canada. Like I had been Mm. in therapy for about a year and a half. And I remember I had thought, okay, I, I want to I wanna do this. Like, I want to change careers. I want to become a therapist. And I had started to look at ways of, can I go back to school but here in Mexico? And it was like, they weren't going to accept my Canadian degree. I was going to have to start from scratch. And I was like, well, that's silly. And I remember one of my best friends at the time, she was visiting me. And I had the day off. And I had med- I was meditating that morning. And I had just previously signed up to do um, a yoga teacher training from my yoga teacher here in in Vallarta at the time. And I was in meditation and I heard the voice again. And it literally said, the yoga teacher training is Vallarta's last gift for you. It's time for you to go. And I got chills. And I came out of my bedroom that morning and I was crying because... Vallarta, I have always said, is my soulmate. Mm-hmm. Like it's it's healed me in so many ways. And so to come out of my bedroom and I'm bawling my eyes out, my best friend is like, 
what could possibly have happened? We haven't even gotten up yet. And I'm like, I'm moving back to Canada. And she's like, what? Because no, if you had asked anybody who knew me, I was never moving back to Canada. But mm-hmm. I knew it. I felt it. Well, so and that I just circles- put my faith in that. And then once again, everything just lined up. And isn't that how it always happens? I mean, with the powerful process of trauma release, right? Things come to us ex- at exactly the right times at exactly the right moments. Synchronicities. I think the word Nancy and I like to use is synchro destiny. Nance? Yeah. Yeah, synchro destiny. Yeah. That's one. That's I, mean, I, I have stories that I could tell too, but I mean, it's just wonderful how things fall into place exactly as they're meant to all in divine time and you know being blessed to be able to hear and know and like nancy said trust trust okay. that knowledge you know yes i'm, I'm sure nancy could well, I, I know that nancy could tell many stories well, because i'm reading well, her memoir when we talk now. about trauma yeah yeah that's that's one of my beta readers I'm, I'm so blessed i'm so 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 blessed it's a big it's a big experience for me Trauma release. Wow, that that's a big one. That's a big one because the words like trigger is a very well known phrase, but trauma release isn't as spoken of yet. We experience it in our daily. Is it why we cry at a funeral sometimes when it's not even someone that we know? How is it that we release those Good things? Question. Not always, it's not always provoked by therapy, yet therapy is very effective. What kind of therapy was it that you were taking? At the time, um, my therapist that uh, I was part, like when I was a client, it was a lot of talk therapy, but um, I was just, it was that moment where I was so ready for it. I just, I didn't know what was happening, but I knew I couldn't get out of it on my own. And like in our first session, she was like, okay, I can help you. But, you know, and and this was mid-July in school, like the the school year as a teacher, it was going to start up in a few weeks. And she's like, I can get you ready, but you're going to have to do the work sign me up so she's like at least one hour a day reading and journaling and she gave me a couple books to read and man I was all about that because I have always journaled that's always been part of my process and reading and suddenly like the switch flipped and I started to shift so much on the inside Mm -hmm. you know yoga had helped me meditation and kirtan had always been part of it but like suddenly there was just this awareness that was happening and i just knew that it was all together that was supporting this change in my life that mind body soul connection (laughs) so then you finished your yoga teacher training Uh did you teach no, okay. Okay. I literally okay. moved back to Edmonton <clears throat> about a week after I had done the training. Wow. And, you know, that synchro destiny, like you ladies had mentioned. Um, previously, I had worked for a school board in Edmonton, and normally they only keep your file for five years and then they destroy it. And I had been gone for nine, but I was coming back okay. with Spanish as one of my languages, which I didn't have before, and French and English. And before I had even arrived, I had an interview scheduled at that same school district. And when I went in, she had my file from nine years ago that had all my contracts in it, all my recommendations. She's like, we're going to get you a job. And I was like, okay, let's do it. So it just kind of, again, you know, everything lining up, it was perfect. And it allowed me to have some space to settle. And a few years later is when I started my master's degree in counseling 
because I wanted to focus on trauma mm -hmm. and supporting people through their different types of trauma. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's much needed. It's much yeah. needed, much yeah. needed. There's been a lot of uh, social isolation, social isolation, which has really um, incubated problems mm -hmm. that are ready to be birthed. Big yes. problems. Yeah, big problems. Mm -hmm. I think it's why we so often see the uh, 50 year old marriage. I mean, I've been married for, well, not necessarily married for 50 years, but uh, we've been together for 25 years and we're looking at retirement and uh, we get a divorce instead. Because the idea of spending all that time together is like a hell no mm -hmm. because we haven't cleaned up the business of being married. Yes. Yeah, because mm -hmm. being married is dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Yeah. yeah, even the best marriages. It's not like the marriage is necessarily traumatic, but perhaps the loss of a loved one or a car accident. The, like mm -hmm. trauma is a big envelope. Yes. It's a big envelope. Yeah. Well, and well, I, good. Sorry. No, I was, go was, was going to say, and, and trauma is so different for so many different people. Like everybody's trauma is their own. And, mm -hmm. you know, what I've lived through, nobody else would want to live through. And I wouldn't want to live through what you've lived through, you know? Like it's, what does this say? Our universe is where we can share our stories of our bravest and most heartbreaking moments with each other in a world that builds connection. Amen. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And to, to know I, that there's I other people there for us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because how do we choose that person that we're willing to open our hearts to? Mm -hmm. That that vulnerability on both sides, not the comparative vulnerability, but the vulnerability that says, this is what I've experienced. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. Not well, and Peter Levine, no, and Peter Levine, who created Somatic Experiencing, which is the primary lens of trauma that I work with, he had one of his most well-known quotes is something to the effect of trauma isn't what happens to you, it's what happens in the absence of an empathic witness, empathetic witness. So without having someone to really just bear witness to mm -hmm. what you've experienced. And so that kind of speaks to what Daphne, you were saying, right? Mm -hmm. Like your experience might be very different from my experience and it's not a comparison, right. but it's like, can someone sit with you and just be with you through mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. And be heard. Empathetic be witness. Yeah. Empathetic witness. Yeah. So tell us, what's the difference between, mm, okay, so we're going through the Facebook posts. There's an experience and we have the um, condolences. Okay. I'm sorry for your loss. What would words of empathy sound like? You know, um, it's a good question when, cause I'm also a grief recovery specialist. And one of the things we often talk about is even just using the words, like letting them, the person know, I can't imagine what you're going through, right? I can't, somebody who loses their mother, somebody whose husband has just died, I don't understand that right now. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine what you're going through. I'm here for you. Mm -hmm. Right? And even from that grief perspective, 
It can be as simple as just checking in on that person. You know, when some when we lose someone, there's that rush of people for the first week or two. And then everybody fades away. Everybody continues with their life. There's this idea that, you know, we just get over it. We've adjusted. But that's not the reality mm -hmm. for most of us. And so it's like checking in on that person, bringing them dinner, you know, remembering those important days, anniversaries, birthdays, whether it's Mother's Day, Father's Day, and just saying, hey, yeah. do you need, do you want to go for coffee? Do you need something? How are you doing? Mm -hmm. Right? Very important. Very, very important. I remember um, Emily passed in 2011, and there was something that happened. It would have been within six months, and I don't remember exactly what it was. It was a shooting of a sort, and I don't remember if it was a police officer or, but it was it was a big, big movement, mm -hmm. and there were yellow ribbons that were tied around the trees. And I hated them. I wanted to take every single ribbon and rip it off the tree because to me in that moment, she had been forgotten. Mm -hmm. And it was a real challenge for me, those big celebrations of other people and what they were going through. Not that it was a celebration, but it was a remembering. Mm -hmm. And having a friendly face to share it with was very, very important to me. Very mm -hmm. important. I went to a um, psychologist years later, uh, a couple years later when I separated from my ex-husband, but that was different. Having a friendly person that I didn't perform for, that I could just lay it all out on the table for was very helpful, very helpful. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, especially it, with like, grief, like there's these myths about grief, about things like we have to be the strong one. You know, women in particular, there's this pressure to grieve alone. So a lot of my clients, it's like when we're talking about where they're expressing it, women who are mothers or wives or daughters, they're crying in the shower or they're crying in their car. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, mm -hmm. I don't want my children to see me upset. I don't want my husband to see me upset. It's like, I just got to do, and it's like, you need someone who you can just take that mask off and just be as raw as you need to be to feel those emotions. Yeah, we do. We cry in the shower. We cry in the car. I wonder where the men cry. Mm. A lot of times they don't. They also feel that pressure to be the strong one. Mm -hmm. And it comes out mm -hmm. often in other ways. Mm -hmm. It turns into anger, aggression. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Addiction. Mm -hmm. Addiction. Addiction. Addiction on both sides, male and female. That's the human experience is addiction. Um, mm -hmm. In its many, many, many flavors. Addiction is like the ice cream counter. You know, there's the, mm -hmm. the black... The Krish, the Tiger Tiger, the bubble gum, the vanilla, pistachio. It's the same with addictions. It's the food, mm -hmm. it's the shopping, it's the gambling, it's the womanizing, it's the alcohol, it's the drugs, it's work. Mm -hmm. Anything to avoid. Yeah. yeah. Keeping busy. The dance of avoid. Yeah, keeping busy. Keeping busy. I'm good. I'm good. How are you? You know, deflection. Mm -hmm. Boy, there's a big list of it. There's a yeah. big list. Yeah, it's it's truly, there's a playlist. I remember um, I had different playlists on my uh, iPhone and I had Emily's playlist. I listened to her music. That was a, boy, I just kept on ripping that Band-Aid off. Um, there was the Angry playlist. Um, I had Ozzy Osbourne. I still have Ozzy Osbourne War Pigs. <laughs> there's a few good heavy metal songs on those ones. You know, Adele, Adele for the, for the woman whose husband's left her, Adele. Mm -hmm. 
you know, whatever it takes to break through the layers. Um, I think it's important and to find that sacred space that you can share it in. Yeah. Super important. So somatic. Tell me more about that. Yeah, okay. This is this is lights this lights me up. I love <laughs> talking about somatic experiencing. Um so somatic experiencing is an intervention that was created by Dr. Peter Levine. And as he describes it, he like he would watch animals in nature and and just all his different studies. And it's a way of trauma processing. So in psychology, we talk about two different ways to process things top down. So it's where we work starting with the thoughts and the feelings and then the behaviors. Or there's bottom up. And bottom up is that acknowledgement of we will often walk into a situation and we will have a sensation or a perception. And that sensation of perception gives us information, whether it's then a feeling and then a thought. Mm -hmm. So it's like that okay. idea of you meet someone and you're like, oh, I have an immediate, oh, bad vibe. Mm -hmm. That's that sensation, perception, turns into a feeling, turns into a thought. And that is how in somatic experiencing, we work with trauma because we can process and desensitize all we want mm -hmm. about an event, whether it's a sexualized assault or you know, an abusive relationship, a car accident. We can outthink ourselves from the trauma, but our body has that memory of it. And so through somatic experiencing, we're working with the sensations that show up in the body. It's also why People who, for example, say to me, I don't have a lot of memory from childhood. I, yeah, that's okay. We can work with your body's memory of it because mm -hmm. you might not have that conscious memory. Your brain has worked really hard to keep you safe in order to allow you to get to this point. But there's exercises that we can do where we're going to move some of that out of your body without having the need to go into a specific memory. I have a question. Mm. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm like, she's a teacher, but I go, <gasps> <laughs> just being respectful. Um, is, is there one sort of, okay, two questions. Is there one practice that's your favorite within those different somatic experiences? And is there something simple that we could do with you today or the people watching could do just to i mean i don't know if this is even an option but it was just a thought yeah okay so there's, there's i love that there's two questions so what it's interesting because every somatic practitioner you know it's a three-year training that we go through right. to become um certified as a somatic experiencing practitioner and we all have learned different activities, different exercises along the way and have a comfort level with them. Mm -hmm. One of them that is one of my favorites to do both with clients and was super eye-opening for me as a client is a standing up exercise. We're not, we won't do that one today, but it was just, I remember in our training, mm -hmm. we were talking about what SE calls, uh, somatic experiencing calls, incomplete fight response. So from the SE lens, people who say come to me and in our first session, I hear them talk about, oh, I get nervous, anxious, I get really worried. That is often a sign that we have a lot of incomplete flight response. My body said, I need to run. And I either didn't or I couldn't, right? We think about children. They, they feel that they're going to get in trouble. They can't run. Or if one parent is physically, emotionally, sexually abusive, they can't run. They have nowhere to go. Yeah. So that gets stored. So often anxiety, worry, fear, that's a buildup of incomplete flight. Mm -hmm. 
when I sit with someone and I hear them talk about, oh, I get so irritated, annoyed, frustrated, angry, then we're working with a buildup of incomplete fight response. And so there's this exercise we do where we stand up and both the client and I are standing and we, we literally will just let the body cycle through and it goes very slow. That's the thing about somatic experiencing. Mm-hmm. We move very slowly because trauma happens very quickly and without our consent. So if you're working with me, we're going to go slow. And I'm going to ask you every step of the way, would it be okay if we did this? Are you okay if we do that? And there's always permission to say no. There's always permission to say, this is too much, or I need to stop, always. But when we were in this training, when it was my turn to be the client or the lender, they called it, here I am standing and I would sway. I was swaying. That's what I did as a teacher. I'd stand up and be giving a lecture mm-hmm. and or just talking with the kids and I sway back and forth. I've done it for years. Mm-hmm. And one of the assistants popped in and he said, Kim, I'm just curious what would happen if you stopped. And I did. And it was like this overwhelming response from the bottom to the top my body just shouted at me no run and i was like what the hell is that it was okay. like learning for me that was my body's way this swaying yeah. was my body's way of preparing me to run in whatever situation i was in and i had no idea yeah and some people sway out of protect just simple protection right I mean, totally. Soothing protection. Yeah. So, okay. Next question. Mm. Sorry. Next, next, I got all these questions. Next question. So you're coming back to Edmonton and are you coming back to Edmonton to do this type of work or are you coming back to Edmonton to be a teacher again? Or is it just coming back? Oh, no, I'm not a teacher anymore. Okay. Um, and I actually do a lot of my SE work online. It is super effective online. I know. Beautiful. It's great. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So I know you had mentioned before, if there was an exercise we could do Mm -hmm. here. So another one that I like to work with, it's similar to the other one, but I also use it for boundaries. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. if you want, and and your, your audience can try it too, I don't know, they might not have the same response, but the invitation is to see what is this space like between us right now and just notice how your body feels when you notice how close I am to you and how close you are to me okay and so just checking in with your body and then what would happen if I were to just move closer how does that that feel feels better actually okay for for me yeah and and not everybody would have that reaction, and so that even just this is a good this is a good this is a good way to even know within the people that you're with in a social setting, just to be and yes. not not to just dive right in. Yes. Okay, like let's not this is this is <laughs> this isn't a bar trip, right? Um, but you know, <laughs> don't practice this, yeah. Um, but that, yeah, okay. Okay, cool. And then to notice what happens if, for example, I'm going to try and do this. What happens when I move you farther away? Yeah, I feel the distance. Yeah. Yeah. And the sadness, right? There, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when when, when I work with people and we're working on boundaries, part of it is first just noticing how do you know that that closeness felt better? What tells you that that felt better? What tells you that moving me moving farther back felt sad or uncomfortable? And then we play with even what's it like for either me to move closer mm-hmm. or what would it be like for you to move closer to me? No. That's cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You want me to move closer? Hang on. Let me move my table. Yeah. 
There we go. <laughs> and so how does that feel for you now? Fine. For me, it feels fine. Fine is not a feeling. Sorry. Feels welcoming. Is that a feeling? Mm. Well, and so what I would ask you is where in your body do you feel that welcoming? Right here. And what? how mm -hmm. would you describe that? Feels like a big hug. Yes. Yeah. And so just noticing that. And so this is where we would spend time exploring that sensation. Mm -hmm. And when I work with trauma, there's two parts that we want to work with. Yes, we want to work into that sensation of the trauma, that trauma vortex, that's what we call it. Mm -hmm. So whether it's an event or a person or even just that acknowledgement that there was something. But we also want to create capacity on the other side. Because often mm -hmm. in terms of our nervous system, mm -hmm. especially if we have lived or been holding on to a lot of trauma, this is what feels really uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. This is familiar. It might not be great, mm -hmm. but this is familiar. And so I'm comfortable in this mm -hmm. chaos. Yeah. And so I want to build capacity with what this feels like as yeah. well. What does that hug feel like? Can we expand that a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more yeah. so that it's not uncomfortable? Because for and a lot of people it is. Well, and, that, and that's fascinating because for what I feel is different than say what would Nancy would feel or cousin Sally. Definitely. Or, pardon me? Definitely. Definitely. So for example, something that I know um, is a boundary for me is when someone raises their finger, even, even just in talking, I know where it stems from, but how is that able to be softened? Mm -hmm. Well, and so what, like if you and I were to work together on that, it would look, it might look like, okay, well, first, Nancy, when you think about someone raising their finger, where do you notice that tension or tightness or heaviness showing up in your body? Shoulder, for sure. Um, shoulder, jaw. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so then we would just kind of explore some of that. We would also, so as a, as a somatic experiencing practitioner, I'm also tuning into my body because sometimes we don't know, like as a client, we don't always know what's happening. We're sometimes not even totally connected to our body, especially as someone who might have experienced a lot of trauma. There's a lot of disconnect, right? That's where we have numbing and dissociation and, and suicidal thoughts. And so sometimes what happens is I pick up on that resonance. Those mirror neurons are sending me information. And so sometimes it's as simple as, huh, you know what? This came up and what I've noticed is that my right toes are cold. And so I might just huh. say, hmm. What is there anything going on with your feet? What do you notice? Brilliant. Wow. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're you're on mute, Daphne. <laughs> I do that on mute? purpose. There we go. <laughs> but obviously because you're so very empathetic and you can feel these things and and, and not hold on to them. That's wonderful. I mean, that's why that's yeah. why I use the tools that I use, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, there's so many things that can evoke, like you were, you were showing with the boundaries, the body movements. Um, Daphne and I have a friend of ours who came to a meditation workshop quite a while back in St. Albert, and I brought out different essential oils. And one of them was pepper. Mm -hmm. No. 
hard no. She knew exactly why. And I mean, pepper is a, well, it's got a lot of options for cooking. So to remove it from your experience because of another experience, mm -hmm. there's a sadness there for me. Mm -hmm. You know, Peter packed a, picked a pack of pickled peppers. I mean, there we go, right? <laughs> like there's so much there. So to learn processes that we can enrich our lives with while healing from trauma, I mean, that's a win-win. Well, and even from a somatic lens, from a somatic experiencing lens, something like that, we would, we would talk about just how fused together, mm -hmm. you know, that pepper is with whatever memory or person it's been associated with. Mm -hmm. So we would want to, or we might work through just separating some of that so that they're not so connected. Mm. Right. And it's like, so we want to, because from that example, this would be considered overcoupling. They mm. have been joined together too much. And then some things we have mm. are undercoupled. They're not, they're, they're potential resources that we haven't built upon. And so we want to strengthen that. But when something like that happens, it's often two things are overcoupled together. And so we want to just release that hold it has in order to mm -hmm. separate them and individuate them like the finger oh, raising it's thing. Empty. yeah the finger raising thing right and and you know what it, it's so much more effective than some of the traditional and i mean everything's got its own place and space but the like the ink blot what do you see when you look at this image you know <laughs> because that can be right like uh, it, it's just, I don't know. It's not, it doesn't feel custom or caring. I, I just that that's, that's me, right? That's me. Mm -hmm. But well, and like we were saying earlier, you know, it's wonderful that there are so many different modalities that can do so many different things because every individual is an individual and everybody experiences things differently. And what will work for me might not work for you. Mm -hmm. And it's wonderful that we have now come to a place in our lives and in society that we reach for things that will help us. Mm -hmm. And I really hope that some people see, I'm uh, sorry, let me rephrase that. I'm excited to hear all of the people <laughs> that contact you, Kimberly, after watching this. Because there are so many people because of the social iso social isolation that have things that they're hanging on to that they have no idea how to get rid of and no idea where to go. But then after seeing this, they'll say, I'm going to contact Kim. Yeah. Well, thank you. I'm excited too. And what's so fascinating about something like SE is that we have, everybody has trauma. You know, Dr. Gabor Mates, Dr. Peter Levine, Dr. Bessel van der Kook, we all talk about everybody has trauma. Yeah. We just don't necessarily know it. And even when I sit with clients, I had one client that were working through stuff and they didn't understand what was going on. And I said, well, something like this could even happen just from a slip or a fall, yeah. right? When we slip and fall, there's a whole orienting process mm -hmm. that gets missed. And from a nervous system perspective, there's a whole, holy crap, I couldn't protect myself. And when I said that, the person was like, whoa, I remember as a kid. And they were talking about these activities that they used to do with their family mm -hmm. that were fun and exciting activities. Mm -hmm. But they're like, I fell off all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, well, and, and mm -hmm. go, no, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, so then just from that nervous system perspective, mm -hmm. there was this, I never got to orient in these situations. Yeah. I, I mean, me coming back from a massive closed head brain injury, I get that, you know, mm. and how my system needed to be rewired and how I knew how to do things, but my body wasn't working with me to do those things. So I had to, 
I can't think of some scientific words to say. I had to rewire my brain mm -hmm. so I could learn new ways to do things. And I might, Absolutely. I mean, I can do things. I just might do them a little bit differently and that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's the beauty of the kaleidoscope of opportunities that are there. Um, it's a buffet. You can eat from many different um, sources. Um, mm -hmm. There's 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 no scarcity of opportunity. There's an abundance of opportunity, an absolute abundance. And you're not taking away from someone else mm -mm. by reaching out for help. Well, and you're that's doing why. No good. A ripple. It's a ripple. It's a ripple. When you heal. Mm -hmm then your entire being changes and someone else might see that and go, Hey, and then that spark, that light, that, that may be. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's why I'm grateful, Nancy, that you've decided to do this podcast, right. Of what matters most so that we can sh share and shine the light. Mm -hmm. Well, and I even like this idea. So often I will say to people, you know, like, because I don't know if you ladies have seen the meme about, you know, like, there's a meme about I have to go to therapy because everybody else in my family won't, right? Or whatever it might be. But what I often will explain to clients is that one cog changes the whole system. And that's why family mm -hmm. therapy was even like the, the benefit of family therapy. The whole family doesn't need to go to therapy. As soon as one person starts to do something different, that whole system gets that ripple effect and starts to change. It's like the ba it's like the baby's mobile, right? If you, I mean, that whole analogy, if you touch one side of the mobile, it changes everything. So I, I get what you're saying. Yeah. Makes sense. It's beautiful to see. It's beautiful to see the, the familiar within the family change. Um, I mean, just imagine what it would be like, because I, 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 I love watching patterns of, of posts and people and, um, you know, Christmas, getting together with the family and all the UG posts. <laughs> what if it was different next year? Because... The UG wasn't there and not the person, but the response to that person. I remember when I first experienced SRT, which is a spiritual response therapy, and it didn't change the person. It changed my response to the person and the person's the same. The person's still the same. That same person that drove me crazy is still a, it's a, they're a small satellite in my life. But it's my um, my ability to be with them that has changed and transformed. Again, why I chose to understand SRT and become an SRT practitioner. It's beautiful. It's so totally. beautiful. Yeah. Well, and I think about it like even from a somatic lens, when I work with someone who say has a, an overloaded nervous system and we start to take some of the edge off, it's like they've said to me then, huh, I wasn't as reactive with my mother-in-law anymore. Mm -hmm. I could feel mm -hmm. her trying to trigger me and I just, I just didn't take the bait mm -hmm. or I had the capacity to go, do I want to be right or do I want to be happy? Mm -hmm. And it's like with the nervous system, when we can start to offload some of that, there is capacity to go, huh, I can pause mm -hmm. and not go into that. I can like make a different choice. Unpacking the backpack, no right? Yep. Yeah. It makes the journey easier. Absolutely. Well, and as we unpack all of our issues and, and, and unpacking them, and looking at them, I don't want this anymore. I'm going to get rid of that baggage. But it's like the cat that crawls back in through the side door over and over and over. It's like, you're back. I thought I, I got rid of you. 
you know, mm -hmm. there's an opening, a space, an opportunity. Um, you know, the universe is filled with mm -hmm. new choices and second chances. It really mm -hmm. is in the most wonderful ways. I, I've, I've been noticing with myself, permission to rest mm -hmm. is big. Mm -hmm. That's a big one because mm -hmm. I rise early, obnoxiously early for many. And um, I mean, <laughs> what time is it now? Yeah, I got, I've, got, uh, I've got 12 hours in. Um, so Nancy's going to have a nap. But I used to push through. I This is right around the time where I would make myself a pot of coffee. Mm -hmm. So I could make it through the rest of the day, you know, and then, and then good old fashioned adrenal fatigue built up. Yes. And um, I was, I, I, I was beyond exhausted, but always tired, like just like raggedy, mm -hmm. tired. And edgy, slightly edgy, extremely edgy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, I would just pop a gasket, I pop a cap, and um, it it just became my normal. And to think of not having that made me very afraid, mm -hmm. very very afraid. Like you were talking earlier about that, right? Like this was my comfort. This is mine. This is who I am. This is what I do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. Well, and there's been a lot of times that I've worked with clients and we will even work through their somatic response to rest or mm -hmm. slowing down because there's often, for, for a lot of people I've seen, there's this, I can't sit down. So there's this nervous system. I need to keep going. I need to push through. I need to go, go, go. And when we dig through into some of the layers, sometimes it comes to that self-worth piece. If I'm not being productive, mm -hmm. I'm not good enough. Sometimes it comes back to messages around what they heard growing up about rest is lazy. Mm -hmm. You can sleep when you're dead like all these kinds of, so it's like, not only do we have to work through the body, but we have to unprogram some of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's very missing out for people. Yes. Fear of missing out, right? Like that person that's sitting in front of the TV, right? It's like, just go, just go in the bedroom and have a nap, right? It's like, no, I'm comfortable here, mm -hmm. right? Um, a lot of that. One of the things that really helped me, um, because I do travel more, um, and sometimes I'm not comfortable where I'm at. So to close my eyes and bring myself to the bed that I am comfortable in, in the home that I am comfortable in, turning a certain way, like if the sun is shining on my face, I'm extremely comfortable. Blackout blinds, oh, not not a fan, not a fan. But <laughs> depending upon the home, right, mm -hmm. that may be where you're at. You may not have a window in the room that you're in, you know. So yeah. finding, finding solutions. There's a lot of solutions available. And I think the more that we build the solutions into our repertoire, when the next nasty comes along, we're prepared. And we have a recipe to look at. Yeah. To choose mm -hmm. from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why I've begun mm -hmm. um, um, scheduling self-care every week. Every week. Mm -hmm. Every week. Yes. I, before the podcast, I just got back from a massage. I, it, they're non-negotiable. And I don't get as growly when Ralph asks me, where are you going? Bra massage. You know, it's, it's not like that. Um, <laughs> it's it's I'm like I'm going to see, I'm going to see Michelle for cranial sacral and massage. Oh, yeah. 
That's this lady. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Big, big, big difference in my life self-care. Mm -hmm. And I mean, perhaps one day I heard this um, on a beautiful podcast, 10 years from now, when the entire world is a barter system, we just trade and exchange mm -hmm. everything. Beautiful. I like that one. I yeah. do too. Let's put that one out there. Plant the seeds for that one. Yeah. That would just be so neat. I like, yeah. I like that one. So, Ms. Kimberly, I'm wondering, is, do you have any final thoughts for us or any words of wisdom that you could share with people that are watching this podcast? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think for me, I would say that being open and willing to look mm -hmm. at your experiences mm -hmm. and walking into them is probably one of the most courageous things a person can do. Mm -hmm. It's not easy going to therapy. As someone who has been in therapy, I'm like, oh my God, the amount of time I've spent balding in my office, in my, my therapist's office or whatever. But I know it was a game changer for me and I've seen it be a game changer for my clients. I've seen it for my friends who go to therapy. And it's just like, we put so many limitations on what our life can be like. And we don't realize that something as small as just committing to yourself, investing in yourself, so you're not carrying that backpack, it can be a game changer. And mm -hmm. recognizing that, you know, I have clients that have come to me and they know that they have trauma and they don't always want to get into it. And just know that some of your trauma can be unpacked without having to tell the story. And that's the beauty of somatic experiencing is we don't have to unpack any story to move some of that out of your system because your body will tell me mm -hmm. and we can move it out from your nervous system and support you in having a healthier way of being. Beautiful. Yeah, I think those are probably my mm. my final words. That's that when the you said magic doesn't always need to be told. The story doesn't always need to be told. Sometimes telling the story is helpful. Um, but the story doesn't always need to be told. I like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's beautiful. Honest Bonio. I like Nancy. I like Kimberly. She uses magical too, just like me. <laughs> Hey, there's it's lots of magic one. in the world. It's I know. Well, there really is. There really is. And when you find something that you want to learn, it doesn't have to be for work. It doesn't have to be for a career. It can simply be a longing to be able to learn. I know for me, learning more Spanish is very important to me. I want to learn how to say over easy for my eggs. I always forget that one. I always forget that one and I get that one in scrambled commit confused. And so I'm not the one to ask today because I will probably end up telling you scrambled. <laughs> and then you'll be like, what the heck did Kim tell me this for? I'm like, I'm sorry, Nancy, I told you scrambled. Well, not because it's not just a simple <laughs> phrase, right? But that's the kind of yeah. that's the Spanish that I want to learn just for me. Mm -hmm. You know, just for me. So if we can make this more instead of the hashtag me too hashtag just for me yeah yeah that's okay. special so thank you so much for taking the time with us this was an absolute joy i've got the sun shining on me now I see that um i'm almost <laughs> feeling tropical mm -hmm. um <laughs> almost she's going outside. to mexico Don't soon work. I know, I, I know, right? She gets to escape shortly. Down, right? It's coming along. Two weeks, two weeks to today. So when this airs, I am in Mexico. 
fabulous. Cool. Super cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's neat. Yeah. You know, go after your dreams, ladies and gentlemen, they do come yeah. true. Go after them. And no, you know, no, dream is too big. no, no dream is too big. No dream is too big. The I possibilities like that. These so, are infinite. Mic drop. Yeah. Mic drop. That's right. Mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all for choosing joy and we will see you again very, very soon. Peace out. Thank you, ladies. Hmm. See ya.